Uh, so thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Shanks. I was PI of the BST Atlas, which was a sort of filler project for the wonderful kids project led by Kuhn and the kids team. Uh, so I'm speaking today on behalf of this wonderful set of people, uh, Nigel Metcalf, PhD student at the moment, Alice Elk, but previous PhD student, Bezad Ansarunajad, all at Durham. But also remembering all our friends at ESO who do the actual observing with VST. Uh, also the Cambridge people who did the basic reduction, the Edinburgh Whitefield Astronomy Unit who do the archiving and the band merge catalogs. We also had people at Chile helping us doing subsidiary sort of surveys to help as well, everybody else as well. Uh, and as you see, it took some time. Uh, when I started this project, I was the same age as uh, Angus, who's just given the talk, but now you see I'm um, more middle-aged and possibly just had my 40th birthday. So you see that these projects can uh, last quite some time. Now, so there is some aspect, a historical uh, aspect to this talk, but what I'm going to talk about is give an overview of the survey of the Atlas, then the cosmology highlights. Uh, so there are galactic highlights as well, but uh, I'm not qualified, I'm even less qualified to talk about those and I'm to talk about the sort of extra galactic ones. But I'm going to, so to save the talk, having a slightly similar look to one I gave here a few years ago, uh, I've flung in this galaxy halo mass function via QSO CMP lensing, trying also to uh, satisfy the title of the whole session, which is, what is it, Galaxy Environment and Evolution. So I'm trying to fill a little bit of that in, describing what that we're doing currently with the Atlas, rather than what we've done previously. And then I'm going to talk about one, briefly about one uh, uh, future use of Atlas that we are trying to do. So this is the VST, the BLT Survey Telescope. Uh, 2.6 meter telescope with a one square degree field and 0.21 arc second pixels as you've heard uh, the kids, this is the, the Omega cam as a camera and it's the one that kids use as well as Atlas. So, um, as I say, you could regard uh, Atlas is a sort of Southern Sloan, that's how it was designed, doing something like 5,000 square degrees of the Southern sky to the same sort of G of 22 and a half magnitude limits that uh, Sloan did in the North uh, and using the same bands, UGRIZ, that they did uh, in this one square degree field. What is one thing that's significantly better than SDSS is despite the fact we were a backup survey for bad seeing sort of nights when it, kids couldn't work, we still ended up somehow that me and Kuhn still failed to understand, but we were very pleased about with something like 0.8 at second seeing, for instance, in the I band and the median average. Uh, and so that's one of the unique selling points of the Atlas that we would distinguish it from SDSS. As I say, it took a long time, started in September 2012, and it's completed somewhere around May 2020. The latest release was DR4, it was done in May 2019. DR5, it's taken a longer time to get the DR5 out than we would like, but essentially we've run out of money and people like Nick Ross in the room here at Edinburgh are essentially doing voluntary work to get DR5 out because the only funding we've now got is uh, Shanks's pension basically uh, from the university. So that makes life uh, difficult and things slower than we'd prefer them to be. So this is the footprint on the sky. Uh, the green areas are the, uh, what's happened to the green in this? It's weird. The green is under there. Yeah, but it should be green over here. So something in the, in the uh, display that, uh, is it coming in? It should, 
Yeah, sorry about that. So there's a southern part here, which is covering the kids' area uh, over like this, uh, where you have the SGC, something like uh, 2,700 square degrees and 2,000 square degrees over on the left here in the northern galactic cap, although all south of the equator at deck zero. And this is the kids' north area, and this is the kids' south area. This is also supposed to show our competition or part of our competition, which is the DES area, which also part we partly overlap with. Um, anyway, I'm sorry about that. But anyway, I say the Atlas unique selling points are uh, not only the median seeing is sub at second, I'll show you in a minute, but we have deep U band, something like 240 second exposures compared to 60 seconds for SDSS, although some of this is inflated due to more readout noise with uh, omega cam in a 60 second exposure. So usually we have four times 60 seconds in you or two times 120 seconds in the more recent stuff, which is even less affected by uh, readout noise than, uh, than the shorter exposures. So here you see the U band 1.09 out seconds. That's actually over an out second in terms of its median seeing. The G band, those sub out second median 0.97, the R band 0.95, I band at the same 0.83, and Z up a little bit 0.87. But you see, it's all sub out second median, despite the fact we were a filler. So I think that's good. So there are some issues. In the early days of the VLT survey telescope, there was more scattered light in Omega Cam. Uh, VST was designed to get good seeing, so it had a lot of open apertures in the telescope dome to ensure the air through was planar and therefore conducive to good seeing. But in the early days, the baffling wasn't quite good enough. And at the beginning, we had scattered light problems, which led to the flat fields, for instance, being corrupted. And so you ended up with illumination corrections that were needed. So just note that in all our data releases, this illumination correction effect, you know, this uh, thing it would lead you to plus minus 0.1 magnitude variation in the flat fielded data between the middle and the edge. That would uh, that has been applied. I feel Cassidy applied uh, this illumination correction in the catalogs, but you should note that that is not applied in the reduced images. So the data to do that can be supplied by CASU, but it's not immediately, it has not immediately been done by them in the reduced images. Uh, calibration though is very good. The original idea was to use two at minute overlaps at the edge of each tile to do a sort of matching up uh, tile to tile to spread the calibration out from where the ESO had taken good uh, calibration photometric sequences during the observations. We tried that in GRIZ, but the residuals actually ultimately turned out to be higher than when we, you know, with other overlapping surveys like PANSTARS and SDSS, than when we just use Gaia with suitable color equations to calibrate the GR and IZ bands. That gave us the lowest. Uh, residuals with respect to the surveys in those bands. Uh, you have to note again, there is a little bit of correlation in the places of the sky where you have uh, large EB minus D, which isn't very much for a atlas because it's designed to be a high latitude survey, but at the edges of the survey, there's some correlated error because of these color equations not applying in places where the dust EB minus V is uh, higher than, than usual. The U band, actually, we had the best residuals were given using the two at minute tile overlaps because the, the gap between U to the BGR uh, system of Gaia was just too large. And so there we have used the two at minute tile overlaps. So for GRI Z, we get something like plus or minus 0.02 uh, residuals in magnitudes. Uh, for the U band, we get something like plus or minus 0.03. So that takes me on to highlights, these uh, cosmological highlights. 
So some of the best work, actually, the most highly cited work was done early on by the Cambridge group doing stuff that Durham wasn't interested in at the time, which was detecting dwarf galaxies that hadn't been seen before in the previous photographic data in the side. But so two objects, they, they detected quite a few Belakurov, Mike Irwin and collaborators, and they detected two dwarfs, for instance, in Crater, one shown here, which looks quite respectable. This one here, right at the survey limit of Atlas, but still now being verified with, uh, you know, bigger telescopes and spectroscopy in terms of getting redshifts and so on. And this crater too is said to be as big as the LMC, but with a very low velocity dispersion. And uh, the Mon people, for instance, suggest that this is an object that at least a few years ago they claimed they had predicted the existence of this sort of object uh, uh, in advance. So that's a nice result that for those sort of people. This again is trying to make the case that the South, even if there was no other interest than doubling the area of sky that SPSS covered or, or so on, there's still a lot of interesting cosmological uh, aspects to Southern sky astronomy um, because the local groups uh, direction with motion with respect to the CMB is this is of course our survey areas in green uh, slightly elongated on this uh, projected plot but the local group so our motion dipole motion essentially ends up moving in this direction here sharply at superclusters including this area atlas so which is possibly one of the sources of that dipole motion we also have the 2DF galaxy redshift survey uh, Southern aspect in the middle with a gamma G23 field here, South Galactic Pole here, and the CMB cold spot is up there. So, all of interest in terms of uh, extra galactic astronomy. So, one of the things we've done recently, Bezard's thesis, included a galaxy cluster catalog using the Atlas data. And so, this is a picture in the uh, SGC of the galaxy clusters. Each point is one of our galaxy clusters. And yellow, for instance, marks the ones that are Abel clusters. So although we go much deeper than the Abel catalog and find many more uh, clusters to higher redshifts, we detect something like 74% of the Abel clusters uh, that were already known. Uh, we, to do this, we use the ORCA, uh, which is a over dense red sequence cluster algorithm to detect these clusters. You see in other things like X-ray and also in SZ from Planck, uh, we also have similarly high detection rates of their catalogs. So it's a good um, catalog, which I uh, suggest you use. We're also using it, as you see in a minute, in terms of weak lensing via magnification bias, looking at how uh, the clusters uh, lens background quasars, and then we can measure the mass of the clusters using that lensing effect, that QSO magnification bias that they talk about. And the point nine out second seeing also allows uh, lenses to be detected. There's been various papers on lens detection. These didn't, didn't not including these because these are previously detected arcs uh, that you actually see in this sort of very uh, bright, not half as deep as kids, uh, Atlas data, but it's also demonstrating again the value of having this seeing in at least some of the tiles. Uh, these, you see these, these, see these arcs in data of SPSS or Atlas depth if the seeing is 0.66 at seconds rather than double that one at second like so. Well, they do see some of these same uh arts as well the brighter ones so i'm going on now to describe what we did 2019 this was cross correlating of course with a plank cmb it covers the whole sky this is our southern area sgc area uh mapped by plank this is our luminous red galaxy sample in the south as mapped by atlas and there's an effect known as the integrated sash wolf effect, which uh, if a CMB photon crosses through a supercluster, 
And if you have an accelerating universe, universe accelerates as the photon is passing through that supercluster. That gives you a higher temperature. That means the gravitational redshift ends up giving you a higher temperature for that CMB photon than it would have otherwise. So if you then cross correlate luminous red galaxies or clusters with the direction of the CMB photons in the sky, it, you predict a cross correlation uh, through this integrated science filter effect uh, that you only get if you're living in an accelerating universe. Uh, and if you're living in an omega-1 Einstein Sitter universe, you don't see it. So you should see this correlation. And we've looked for this in SDSS and found that to some extent existed. This is uh, dividing our LRGs into 0 0.35, 0 0.55, and 0.68 redshift bins. Red points are SDSS, black points are Atlas. And you see uh, you just get something of a detection at low redshift, something of a detection that agrees with the uh, lambda CDM prediction at 0.55, but always at 0.68 uh, with the Sloan or with Atlas, you're consistently not getting a, a fit. Uh, but what, how significant that is, is debatable. Uh, if you combine all these three to get this combined thing, the data is always still lower than the lambda CDM prediction. Does that mean we live in a Einstein Sitter universe or something like that? Probably not. It's not clear definitively that whether this is an agreement. We haven't really got enough statistics yet. John Peacock always said that maybe the whole sky wasn't enough to give you a, a good detection of ISW with, uh, you know, this sort of technique. So you could always raise omega a little bit to get rid of a bit of lambda, uh, but w that may not or may or may not be justified on the basis of this still not completely definitive data. More interesting, as I did, as I showed you, the CMB cold spot is sitting here in the atlas, in the Planck data, which has always been a few sigma deviation from what you expect in the Lambda CDM cosmology. So it was interesting to see uh, if there was an integrated SAS wolf uh, explanation for that cold spot, uh, because people previously using the Pan-Star survey had claimed that if you look at density, galaxy density versus redshift in that cold spot line of sight, then you see this under density between about red, between 200 and 1,000 h to the minus one megaparsec. This is zero, you know, uh, no cluster, no void result here, but they seem to see a result using photometric redshifts that indicated you had a large void in front of the CMB cold spot. And in that case, instead of an enhancement of the temperature of the CMB, in that line of sight, uh, you actually expect a lowering, and that would be an explanation there for if you'd avoid in front of the uh, cold spot, that would be uh, ISW integrated science group effect uh, could explain it. So we went after this with a venom in Rory McKenzie's PhD thesis, but we got went instead of using photometric redshifts, we use spectroscopic redshifts and tried to, we made a survey out to about redshift 0.5 using AT2DF, getting about 7,000 uh, galaxies uh, to, to try and hope that we see a void. Uh, but if you compare this black histogram with the background green histogram, the green histogram is those four gamma fields that Angus just showed you miles away from the direction of the cold spot. Uh, and showed you that, the, that this is showing that the distribution of uh, the galaxies in the cold spot region, the black histogram, is not so different from the uh, distribution of the gamma points, which is sort of control sample. In fact, G23 is an exact, uh, so that's one of the gamma fields at 23 hours. This thing's at three hours. And it, it the gamma people observed there in the same band that we observed in the eye. So it was our initial, 
you know, the idea that that was our actual control sample. And if you see, it's a wonderful control sample because the black is again the same as here, the cold spot direction and that. Uh, but here, right the way through the nights that we were on the AT, it was quite obvious that the G23 control sample, some 600 megaparsecs away across the sky at redshift point two, was a kind of similar NZ, you know, in detail, not just an average to the um, to the cold spot direction. So that makes it a great controlled field because you've got almost exactly the same galaxy distribution in both fields, but so there's no cold spot or anything like it in the gamma G23 direction. So it absolutely excludes, to my mind, uh, any sort of void ISW foreground explanation for that cold spot. And so this therefore, but it still leaves this interesting issue, which we still haven't got to the bottom of, of why over a 600 megaparsec gap over the sky in the south. And you can see this thing as you interpolate with 2DF in between times that you see the same sort of distribution, you know, it's this coherence across this SGC. The other people actually have claimed in the past, but I never believed, but now I'm sort of st st starting to believe it. And it's still an interesting effect that needs further explanation. Uh, and anyway, the Guardian got it overexcited. And of course, if you haven't got a foreground uh, explanation for the cold spot, you have to have some other explanation. And it's always been a possibility that if you have two, you know, you have a multiverse and our universe bubble collides at early times with another bubble of the multiverse, that could also be an explanation for the cold spot. And so if you've ruled out the main idea of the explanation of the void, then uh, that leaves you possibly with only one or two much more exotic explanations, one of which is multiverse. That's what the Guardian took up with. Have uh, astronomers uh, found evidence for, of, of parallel universes in the multiverse. And uh, we didn't discourage them from going over the top with this type of interpretation, although I still don't think it's uh, quite justified. But it's interesting. So having good seeing and being good in the UV, that means it's a good survey for detecting QSOs. And this just gives you some highlights of that work. Here, Ben Shahade, one of the previous PhD students from like 2016, made a survey 20 odd thousand, uh, sorry, 10,000 G less than 22.5 Atlas quasars. And we looked at various things like uh, clustering of quasars, and it's dependent on quasar luminosity and didn't find any actual interesting results from that survey. We'll come back to that again in a minute. It, it combined with, uh, Viking and Vista Hemisphere Survey, our sister infrared surveys, but also with the WISE and NEOWISE W1 and W2 3.6, 4.5 micron band survey from their satellite. It was also good at picking up redshift greater than six quasars. So we pick up a few of those and then got Spectrum with X shooter and published that. Paul Schechter and friends, including Adriano Agnello, used our survey wonderfully to pick up quad quasar, you know, lens from this foreground object into quads, and you get a lot of information from time delay stuff and other stuff from those sort of uh, analyses. So it was all very good for picking up uh, quasars of variety of redshifts, five minutes, right? So, hang on, five minutes, 40 minutes I've got. <laughs> we don't want any, too many questions here. Uh, but anyway, so this is me going to go into the environment of Quasar to try and link up something we're doing with Atlas with the overall title of the, uh, uh, you know, the session. So one absolutely important environmental factor for galaxies is, of course, what their halo masses are. Uh, and so Traditionally, what people do is use high peaks bias and clustering. And I'll come back to what I mean by that in a minute. So you look at the galaxy galaxy clustering and use this idea of high peaks biasing, which essentially tells you that uh, higher mass halos cluster more. And so you try to fit your galaxy correlation function, your clustering statistic by adjusting how many galaxies populate 
high mass halos versus low mass halos to sort of fix it things. So you get a halo occupation distribution, they call it, so that you uh, fit the galaxy clustering statistics as well as you can. But what we can do here, as well as doing that first step, we can now test the, those uh, results uh, using both by what the foreground galaxies, how they lens the background QSOs that we're picking up in Atlas, and how they also those galaxies lens uh, the, the CMB in the background. So we use a technique where you cross correlate the background QSOs, for instance, with the foreground galaxies and uh, to detect this sort of magnification bias. So what you had Angus talk about before with kids was detecting lensing using shear, where you look at the shapes of the galaxies. Of course, quasars are point sources. They don't, their shape uh, isn't affected. It's still to the point source after lensing as before. But if you, you know, you get magnification still, and so you get, you should get more quasars in the line of sight of a cluster, a foreground cluster or foreground galaxy than you would do otherwise. Uh, and you get that simple intuitive effect of more quasars if you're in a place where the quasar counts are steep. And so it's the excess quasar counts being lensed into your sample that dominates. So you get a positive correlation in that case. In the other case where you've got on a, on a flat area of a quasar number count, it's the loss of solid angle behind the cluster or galaxy that dominates. And that loss of solid angle behind the cluster caused by lensing magnification uh, means you should get fewer quasars. So an anti-correlation between foreground galaxies and background quasars uh, in the case where you're dealing with fainter 20 to 22 and a half magnitude quasars, for instance, where the quasar count is flat. So that's the basic effect that we will be using. And this, of course, is so that's when you're lensing quasars. But of course, there's foreground things also uh, lens the Planck CMB, and Planck uses its temperature data, its polarization data, combines them uh, wonderfully to get uh, Planck CMB lensing maps, which are available and which we use. So, again, this is the idea, which I'm sure you all know high peaks bias. If you have some thresholding effect that says that only above a certain matter density are you going to get stars to form in a high peak, then uh, uh, even though if it was a local high peak that everything depended on, you'd get galaxies here, here, and here, as well as here, here, and there. But if it's an overall absolute uh, threshold for star formation, then you only get these uh, galaxies in these upward fluctuations, large scale fluctuations, you don't get galaxies down in these downward fluctuations. And so these look much clustered on the sky than uh, if you had the whole mass correlation function, you just have the galaxy correlation function, this thresholded um, forming down to this threshold, then you get much higher clustering. So, you can always get increasing halo mass, or I'm using the angular correlation function clustering of galaxies on the sky here. But as you halo mass goes up, so then the amplitude of the galaxy correlation function goes up. And using this information, you can sort of tell uh, from the amplitude that you're measuring in the correlation function your observations, how many galaxies at high mass halos are in there is against how many galaxies at low mass halos. So you see the problem, and this is why it's interesting to talk about this just generally, because this is, could be said, if you were being careless with words, how Carlos Frank fiddles the data to get a Lambda CDM model to fit small scale galaxy clustering uh, correlation functions. But don't worry, I'm going to come back and apologize to Carlos in just a minute. But we're showing that it's not a bad approach actually after all. But you see, this is the problem, right? This is something like, this is all very rough, but it's just a diagrammatic schematic. Shows you what the halo mass function looks that comes out of lambda CDM model. You get this huge extent of very low mass, or sorry, low mass halos compared to high mass. Whereas the galaxy uh, 
luminosity function or stellar mass function is going across here, we always have to say that none of these things can have any star formation almost at any time in the history of the universe. Otherwise, you'd get a complete contradiction of lambda CDM just by a simple galaxy luminosity function or star mass function. So what you do is you look at these halo occupation distributions. You try to estimate what those are, number of galaxies in a halo of a certain mass. So down here at 10 to 11, with this very simple HOD used by Ryan Stratton a few years ago, just at the beginning of HODs, uh, that halo occupation distribution is one galaxy, a central galaxy in 10 to 11, 10 to 12 solar mass halos, but rising with satellite galaxies, you know, even roughly in proportion to the size of the halo mass uh, as you go further out. So you, know, you multiply this by this halo, so you've got the number of halos and you've got the number of galaxies per halo in this graph, and that leads you to this, or oh, this, uh, sorry, galaxy halo mass function. So you see that most galaxies you see in this prediction to get the cor correlation function right are done at 10 to the 11 solar masses. Some of them that are factor 10 lower are populating things out to 10 to 14, 10 to 15. So the dominated part is about 10 to 11. And that apparently gives you the right clustering. As you see here, this rough hod fit, doesn't fit our data particularly well because we haven't tuned it, but we could tune it a little bit more. And we've got other hods that do a little bit better. Um, but this is a sort of clustering statistic in our Atlas data, how Ryan Scranton's hod, which he fitted the other data, uh, that's how it does with us. So we're saying it's a reasonable fit, at least up at these small scales. So then you look at the cross correlation, right? To look for the lensing. So you're looking at galaxy, these galaxies down the R21, average redshift 0.15, cross clustering with quasars, at, you know, average redshift 1.5. And you see this anti correlation that is predicted by lensing, the loss of solid angle behind the foreground galaxies and galaxy clusters. Uh, and this red line here is this crack model. So there's always been a little bit of uh, difference, but we'd say it's a reasonable fit. If you look at luminous red galaxies, we've done the same experiment with luminous red galaxies, you get a slightly, you know, a more bigger, uh, sorry, a bigger uh, deviation from the data from the LRG HOD, but I'm not showing that just now because I'm trying to be conventional. Uh, but as I say, you can always use those Planck CMB lensing maps. And again, we take our Atlas galaxies and this is all in Alice Elbert's PhD thesis, by the way. Uh, we take the Atlas galaxies, same as here, and uh, those that gave us the quasar cross clustering here in the model fits. And it still seems to fit reasonably here. This is five art minutes. This is 0.5 art minutes. So this is uh, defined by the Planck resolution, five or six art minute pixels. And so this is more the two halo term, or this is more the one halo term. So there still could be differences. So overall, if I was Carlos and the audience today, I'd be taking this as a reasonable uh, confirmation that his hard, how he populates in his M-body simulations, hills of a certain mass with a certain number of galaxies, I'd be taking this as reasonable confirmation that, it, that at least he'd found a fit, whether it was unique or not is another question, but he's managed to translate uh, this into that in a way it doesn't uh is not inconsistent with the lensing results of the quasars or the cmb so then you can start to apply this to the quasars themselves right yeah is it it's getting there yeah <laughs> so this is actually an angular quasar correlation function that started to be detected not just by us but by other people Long time I ago, I thought it'd be impossible to detect angular correlation clustering on the sky without redshift information, photometric redshifts of quasars. But we are getting reasonably consistent results with other people. This is the hard that you would then fit to that data, just using the clustering data. Uh, and then you can, we can't of course check this with background quasars because the quasars are now at redshift one and a half, but we're trying to estimate the HODs and the mass function for themselves. And you see it again at the two halo term where you check, you can check it with a CMB doing the quasar Planck CMB cross correlation. It's not bad, still a little deviation here. So we, we start to see if we can do a little bit better than this, the one halo term up here and the two halo term down here. 
this is all too hell of time because it's starting about at five art minutes and going out. So it's not a bad fit, but uh, and if you translate that then for the quasars, right? So again, you start with I think it comes out on the CDM, the hill mass function. This now is the hard that I've just shown you at redshift one and a half for the quasars fitted from the clustering and not doing too badly on the CMB lensing. But this is the quasar mass function that you get out. And you see it's it's about an order of magnitude higher, but it's still highly peaked around 10 to the 12, 10 to 12 and a half solar masses uh, for the quasars. And it's dropping much faster than the galaxies did towards higher uh, solar mass hills. And so what you can say is uh, that roughly speaking, that was a log plot, remember? So if you put it linearly, that would look like a big delta function spike at 12, 12 and a half you know, log mass, solar masses for quasar halos. And if the all quasars then you might sort of jokingly say, do they all have the same halo mass? And that leads to something that we noticed some time ago, because there's a, of course, a correlation between halo mass and central black hole mass in the galaxies. And that leads to the question, do all quasars then have roughly the same uh, black hole mass? James Ed, who's an expert on all this stuff, used to disagree with this idea. He used to say it was a selection effect. We disagree, but we'll have to leave that discussion for another day. So the future highlights, very simple. Uh, those quasars I've been talking about, and I'll show you again in a second. The Erosita people, uh, before the Erosita shut down for geopolitical reasons, uh, they're gonna do a extra AGN survey out to Redshift two or so with uh, foremost the new fiber optic instrument that ESO is building on the VISTA telescope in uh, Channel Panal. Uh, foremost cosmology redshift survey, co PIs for the whole thing are Jean Paul Neve and Johan Richard, uh, focusing on lensing again with LRG and redshift data source and stuff like that. But I'm sort of vaguely a PI of the quasar part of this. So by sort of extending the 50 or 60 per square degree uh, quasar density that Erosita people are going to get anyway, I was always interested in doubling that density with Atlas and also UVX and also with supplemented by Neowise W1, W2 bands, which we also have and are good quasar pickers at higher redshift, getting up to the 120, 130 square degree uh, densities that the quasars that uh, DESI has, for instance. And so we've, we're still going with that. And we've got something like a million quasars, again, from Alice, Elkvitz, PhD thesis. But we're also using decals a little bit to give better coverage of the uh, DES area south of uh, where Atlas stops, and also using Neowise. But um, this, that's so that, and that's the data set. Red, doing both high redshifts and low redshifts, high redshift and line and alpha, low redshifts. So I've got let's slide one more. The conclusion is I'm just going to leave up. I thought we had to say some of that lessons learned. Well, I'm hoping I've convinced you we're still doing wonderful science. With Atlas. But it did take a long time. First discussed DSP by the Italians in 1998. And of course, it's now been overtaken. Even I'm using DECAM and DECALS and DES photometry for some of this work. But it still has unique selling points. The U band and the seeing combined to give you these wonderful possibilities for quasars. And so it's still a very useful survey, which I encourage you to use even before DR5 becomes available in a, in a few weeks time. Uh, ESO constraints with pros and cons. Uh, at the beginning, we weren't allowed on chip binning and we are still not allowed on chip binning. That would have made the survey go faster because uh, we don't know the limiting factor, particularly in the U-band. 
Uh, but at the end, the increased exposure time we were allowed, and uh, we also at the end got better samples seeing the, that we weren't expecting to get, but are seeing it with a 0.21 arc second pixel is well sampled uh, for this 0.8 arc second or so average sort of seeing. So you need patience. For instance, the global calibration is required. The whole survey, for instance, due to U band overlaps, two up minute overlaps, you have to have the whole data in place before you can calibrate it. And that was only available at the end. So there were one or two issues, the main one of which was the time it took. But I have to say that at the end of the day, ESO, CASNU, and WAHU, it says it all there. Right. Not mucking about. That's a summary. I did the overview up here before this bit. These are the highlights I talked about so over the last 10 years uh, in terms of cosmology, but also mentioned the stuff we're still doing with quasar and CMB lensing, defining, checking galaxy and quasar hordes. And in the future, for, it's still got a role, this Atlas survey, in terms of its wonderful quasar selection possibilities, in terms of being the basis for the foremost cosmology register survey doing 1 million quasars, hopefully, over the next few years with uh, foremost and including the foremost leaders here, people as well. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. <laughs>